as early as 1938, a branch of Shell Petroleum Company had been granted an exploration license to prospect for oil across Nigeria. It would take Nigeria till 1956 to drill the first commercially viable oil well, a feat that undoubtedly influenced the United Kingdom's interest in integrating southern Cameroons into Nigeria with the hope that the territory would also be oil rich. The pace of oil prospecting in the Republic of Cameroon accelerated in the 1960s, leading to the discovery of oil onshore and offshore. The coastal areas of West Cameroon by Elf, the French oil conglomerate. As good as it was to have discovered significant reserves of oil onshore and offshore, the state of West Cameroon, the Republic of Cameroon and French governments were concerned that Cameroon's federal system of government could stand in their way of exploiting these reserves in accordance with Cameroon. France secret commercial accords of 1958 and 1959. As a condition to granting independence to the Republic of Cameroon in January 1960, France had entered into secret accords with Ahijo that gave France priority rights of exploration and exploitation of all subsoil resources, including oil. These were the same accords that had contributed to the 1958 overthrow of André-Marie Bidder, the first head of government of French Cameroon, who had vehemently refused to sign them or agree to a certain kind of independence from France. The conflict of interests in these oil reserves between France, Ahijo, and the state of West Cameroon was triggered not by events within Cameroon, but rather by Algeria's decision to nationalize four foreign oil companies in June 1970. At issue in Algeria were the 1965 Evian Accords between France and Algeria, where the government of Algeria was coerced into accepting only 28 cents per barrel compared to 75 to 90 cents per barrel in other Middle Eastern or South American countries. Faced with economic decline, massive capital outflows and rapidly increasing government spending, the government of Algeria quickly became dissatisfied with the Evian agreements and decided to break the agreements and take over foreign oil companies. With this background, French President Pompidou and French Minister of African Affairs Jacques Focar visited Cameroon in 1971 and started working on a plan to address this potential threat to the French Cameroon secret accords. On May 2nd, 1972, President Ahijo met with the Central Committee of the Cameroon National Union, or CNU, the highest organ of the only political party in the Federal Republic of Cameroon. Plans were put in motion for what would later be called the Peaceful Revolution of the people of Cameroon, the dismantling of the federal structure of government in favour of a unitary system of government giving the president even more powers than he already had. On May 5th, 1972, President Ahijo returned from a short trip to Paris, where he had met with his French legal advisors. In his briefcase from Paris were some very important documents, printed copies of a new constitution for the Federal Republic of Cameroon. He immediately called for an extraordinary session of the Federal Assembly in Yaoundé for May 6th, 1972, with the purpose of proposing his new constitution. While one would normally expect the legislator of a country to be responsible for enacting new legislation, President Ahijo had previously assumed the powers of the legislator and 
many other branches of government through a series of never-ending state of emergency declarations. Whether or not he had the power to enact new legislation, by 1972, President Ahijo was so powerful that he personally represented the state and anyone or any branch of government that dared question his authority ended up in solitary confinement in one of the many prisons around the country. However puzzling it may be that the president could unilaterally revise a country's constitution and himself propose a new constitution to the legislature or National Assembly, it is even more bizarre that the president was not himself the author of the new constitution he was proposing. The real authors of the proposed constitution were French technical advisors, one of whom was Jacques Rousseau, the man credited for writing the Republic of Cameroon's first constitution of February 1960. On May 6, 1972, President Ahijo delivered his much-anticipated speech to the Federal Assembly of Cameroon in Yaoundé. He acknowledged the great strides that the nation had made over the past decade since the reunification of Southern Cameroons with the Republic of Cameroon in October 1961 following the UN-sanctioned plebiscite of February 11th, 1961. President Ahijo noted that over the past decade, the people of the states of West and East Cameroon had become reacquainted with one another in ways that had fostered national unity like never before. He said that the federal system was adopted during reunification with Southern Cameroons only to assure Southern Cameroonians that the legacy they were bringing after more than 45 years of Anglo-Saxon administration would not be ignored, but would also be taken into consideration within the framework of a bilingual and multicultural state. However, he quickly focused on the need to address the federal structure of government and the costs it was imposing on the country, he noted that the federal structure of government required free governments and four houses of assembly. President Ahijo was referring to the governments and houses of assembly of the federal, west and east state governments, as well as the House of Chiefs in the state of West Cameroon. He went on to bemoan the West Cameroon budget deficits which were costing the federal government upwards of 2 billion francs CFA annually. He concluded that given all those facts, the federal structure of government had outlived its usefulness and instead of being a catalyst for growth, had now become a major handicap. In these conditions, où les structures fédérales apparaissent comme un handicap au développement rapide du pays ou en revanche. Le peuple camerounais a déjà consacré dans les faits sa profonde unité, ma conviction, mesdames et messieurs les députés, ma profonde conviction, et que le moment est venu de dépasser l'organisation fédérale de l'État. J'ai, en conséquence, conscient de mes responsabilités à l'égard de la nation et devant l'histoire, décidé de consulter par voie de référendum le peuple camerounais, souverain et maître de son destin, sur l'institution immédiate d'un État unitaire. He then set the date for the referendum for Saturday. May 20th, 1972, to ask the people of Cameroon whether or not to dismantle the federal system of government, and he invited the legislator and the country to review his draft constitution 
in the two weeks before the referendum. Only people not familiar with the internal politics of the Republic of Cameroon in the 1960s would be surprised that West Cameroon was said to be broke and was draining the coffers of the federal government. When Southern Cameroons joined the Republic of Cameroon on October 1st, 1961, it was a rich and vibrant territory. Southern Cameroons was by then exporting over five million pounds of agricultural products to Europe and the US, including bananas, rubber, cocoa, palm oil and peppers, resulting in annual profits of close to one million pounds. Its profits had enabled the territory to not only develop its infrastructure and provide services to its people, but had also enabled it to subsidize the government of Northern Cameroons for many years, sometimes in excess of 150,000 pounds. In 1961, Southern Cameroons was richer than the Republic of Cameroon on a per capita basis, especially considering that Cameroon was heavily dependent on aid from France. Although President Ahijo had said only a federal system of government could have best served Southern Cameroons joining with the Republic of Cameroon in 1961, his unilateral action in 1972 proved how half-hearted the Republic of Cameroon's commitment had been. It was clear that the Republic had accepted a federal government in order to appease the people of Southern Cameroons and win their votes in the February 11th, 1961 pleb site. So how come Southern Cameroons turned West Cameroon went broke between 1961 and 1972? In this interval, President Ahijo had deliberately dismantled all West Cameroon's economic and infrastructure companies to make West Cameroon appear to be financially dependent on East Cameroon. Powercam, a hydroelectricity dam at Yoke that previously electrified Southern Cameroons was closed in favor of getting power from East Cameroon. Cameroon Bank, headquartered in Buya, was one of the strongest banks in the Cameroons, was closed. National Produce Marketing Board that was responsible for selling all agricultural products from the CDC and all of the major plantations through the ports of Tico and Manfe was closed, resulting in poor pricing of West Cameroon's produce sold through the port of Douala. Tico Airport, the international airport of Southern Cameroons, turned West Cameroon, was closed in favor of Douala Airport. Tico and Victoria Natural Seaports were closed. Numerous trade organizations, financial cooperatives and credit unions, engineering and infrastructure organizations and companies were all shut down by 1972, having intentionally crippled the robust economy that West Cameroon inherited from Southern Cameroons. It made sense that on paper at least, Ahijo's claim that federalism and not his direct actions was the reason why the government of West Cameroon appeared to be in the red. Once more, West Cameroon, just like Southern Cameroons before it, was being called a poor territory. Ahijo was simply taking a page out of the United Kingdom's playbook from 1960. When the UK told the United Nations and the nations of the world that Southern Cameroons was poor and would not be viable as an independent country. But it should be remembered that the United Kingdom in its bid to make Southern Cameroons join Nigeria and bolster its economic interests had told Nigeria 
that southern Cameroons was rich and indeed a treasure trove. Article 47.1 of the Federal Constitution of the Republic of Cameroon stipulated that no amendments could be made that would impair the unity and integrity of the Federation. One could interpret this article to mean that no bill could have been introduced to dissolve the Federation itself, even if the President himself had submitted an amendment to dissolve the Federation. Article 47.3 stipulates that such an amendment should have been voted affirmatively not only in the Federal Assembly, but equally by the East and West Cameroon Houses of Assembly. Knowing that he could not have gotten this way with the West Cameroon House of Assembly, President Ahijo cunningly employed Article 2, which mentions the word referendum as a means to enact changes to the Constitution. However, even if Article 2 could have been stretched to serve as a means to make changes to the Constitution, it did not and could not have overridden the very clear language of Article 47. The legal backdoor that President Ahijo relied on therefore was a law passed on the 10th of November 1969 prescribing the conditions and the procedure of the referendum, but even this law should not and could not have overridden Article 47.3. In the prevailing political climate, where dissidents were locked up without due process, no one dared stand up to President Ahijo's blatant violation of the federal constitution. At the conclusion of his speech on May 8th, 1972, all 10 West Cameroon members of Federal House of Assembly walked out together with John Gu Foncia and gathered at Bernard Fon Long's house in Yahunde, leaving all 40 French Cameroon members of Parliament in the house. Tension built up rapidly as President Ahi Joe rapidly ordered armed troops to surround Bernard Fon Long's house while negotiating with the members of parliament. After careful reflection, Fon Long advised that they were ill-prepared and outnumbered and further resistance could have unintended consequences. Bernard Fon Long counseled that they should return to the assembly and leave the war to be fought by their forebearers. Days before the perilous May 6th speech, the government had raised a false alarm of an intimate invasion into West Cameroon from Nigeria, leading to a massive deployment of troops to major towns across the state of West Cameroon. It was not politically wise or physically safe to hold and express views different from the president, let alone oppose, in words or deeds, any of his plans or actions. It was generally known, but highly concealed, in the dictatorial climate of the time, that there was a groundswell of opposition throughout West Cameroon. Ahijo's speech on May 6th automatically and unceremoniously disbanded the East and West Cameroon Houses of Assembly, as well as the House of Chiefs, none of which ever again formally met. The mutiny was muted and all trace removed from the media. Throughout the referendum campaign season of 12 days, everybody was advised against casting no votes. Civil servants were transferred across the national territory to spread Ahijo's good news, pushing the Yes Chorus. They sounded a warning note to all government divisions, all local government areas, that producing a single no vote 
would result in untold reprisals. Although the government has records of having printed no ballots, on May 20th, 1972, voters discovered that only ballot papers bearing the words yes and we were available. If no ballot papers existed, they were clearly not used in voting offices, if not everywhere, certainly in the majority of voting offices across Cameroon. By midday on May the 20th, 1972, President Ahi Jo was already calling the referendum a victory. Two weeks later, he would sign into law the new constitution on June the 2nd, 1972. That was not written or reviewed by the Federal Assembly, not approved or signed by either the East or West Houses of Assemblies, not signed by the Prime Minister of the Federal States of West and East Cameroon. Following the sweeping victory, the population, especially in former West Cameroon, was severely repressed by police forces. Security checks, raids, roadblocks and police cordons in neighbourhoods increased. Anybody who did not have a voting card in their pocket was arrested. The government and military flexed their muscles to deter any public or even private protests against the illegal dissolution of the Federation. Having been denied the option of outright independence by the United Kingdom and having reluctantly participated in the UK and UN sanctioned plebiscite on February the 11th, 1961, resulting in the joining with Cameroon in a federal republic. May the 20th, 1972 is hardly a day of celebration for the people of the former Southern Cameroons. Rather, it is a day that holds little meaning because it represents the day when the federal system of government that should have guaranteed their diversity and way of life, their educational and legal systems, and much more, was dismantled, accelerating the marginalization within the now United Republic of Cameroon. The incompatibility of the France, Cameroon secret accords and the rights of the state of West Cameroon with regard to the allocation of revenues from oil and other resources is at the root of the dismantling of the Federation. If this narrative seems far-fetched, the actions of the government in later years only served to reinforce these arguments. The overthrow of the system of government and the return to the unitary system gave the president all the powers to enforce the secret 1959 Accords with impunity. In later years, an oil refinery would be built in the coastal town of Victoria by Elf, Total, Golf and Mobile. To downplay the town's British roots, in 1982, the town's name would be changed from Victoria, so-called by English missionary Alfred Saker in 1858 to Lean Bay. As a cautionary measure by the unitary government against insurrection by English-speaking locals, the Lean Bay Finery's oil is piped to and stored in Douala in the French-speaking part of Cameroon. And city taxes from oil exploration and refining are paid not to the town of Lean Bay in English-speaking Cameroon, but rather to the city of Douala. The refinery in Lean Bay is overwhelmingly staffed by Cameroonians from French-speaking Cameroon and the rest from English-speaking Cameroon and other countries. These are revenue sharing imbalances and hiring practices that would never have occurred under 
a federal system of government. Today, what was formerly Southern Cameroons, and subsequently West Cameroon, produces over 85% of Cameroon's total oil revenue. Once more, rather than people determining the future of their land, their land had come to define the future of the people. As difficult a pill as May 20th, 1972 was for West Cameroonians to swallow, they chose to rise above it. They chose to continue to hold their heads high and they chose to live and fight this grave injustice another day. As Bernard von Long wisely said on May 8th, 1972, the West Cameroonians chose to leave the war to be fought by their forebearers.